So I don't know how much you guys enjoy uh, listening to me read to you, but I can't help myself uh, because I just love Tehard's uh, writing so much that I want to read it out loud. So I just finished a section on the Neolithic Revolution where Tehard is discussing uh, these intense processes of socialization that brought human beings into the first settled civilizations. And I'm going to read from the next, the next chapter called The Modern Earth, where Tehard discusses what's changed since the Neolithic. And he discusses how uh, we're trying to cast off the last moorings of the Neolithic that sort of um, characterized our existence as a species for the last 10,000 years. And so he's going to discuss the discovery of evolution, not just biological, but cosmological evolution, and to show how this transforms and illuminates our consciousness. Um, so yeah, this is uh, part one, section A. Part one called The Discovery of Evolution, section A, the perception of space-time. We each have forgotten that moment when, just having opened our eyes for the first time, we saw light and objects suddenly rushing in at us from all sides and all on the same plane. It takes a great effort for us to picture a time when we did not know how to read, or to go back again to that period when our world extended no farther than the walls of home and our family circle. In the same way, it is impossible for us to believe that there ever was a time when men and women lived without suspecting that the stars swinging above us actually are light centuries away, or that the contours of life stretch silhouetted millions of years behind us as far as our horizon goes. Yet we only need to open one of the barely yellowing tombs in which 16th or even 18th century authors used to discourse on the structure of worlds, and we find to our utter amazement that our great-great-great-grandparents had the impression of being perfectly adjusted in a cubic space where the stars had been rotating around the earth for less than 6,000 years. They breathed without the slightest difficulty, even if not at full capacity, in a cosmic atmosphere which would have suffocated us instantly, and in perspectives which are physically impossible for us to re-enter. What has happened between their time and ours? I know of no scene more moving, or which so clearly reveals the biological reality of a neogenesis than that of intelligence bent from the beginning on overcoming, step by step, the encircling illusion of proximity. In this process of struggling to master the dimensions and depth of the universe, it was first space. It was space that yielded first, which was natural, since space had been the most tangible. In fact, the first round of the battle was won a long time ago, when someone, probably a Greek, before Aristotle, I think uh, Aristarchus, bending the apparent flatness of things back on itself, intuited that there were antipodes. From that time on, the firmament itself coiled up around the round earth, but the center of the spheres was incorrectly placed. This irremediably paralyzed the elasticity of the system. It was actually only through the break with ancient geocentrism in Galileo's time that the heavens were freed for the boundless expansion we now have come to see in them. The earth has become a simple grain of sidereal dust. Immensity has become a possibility and, symmetrically, as a result, the infinitesimal has sprung up. Since the depth of centuries lacked any visible parameters, it proved to be perceived much more slowly. For it seemed then that the contours of all matter 
the motions of stars, the shapes of mountains, and the chemical nature of bodies, were expressive of an eternal present. In the 17th century, it was impossible for physics to give Pascal any sense of the abyss of the past. To first discover the actual age of the earth and then its elements, the human being had to take a chance interest in an object of moderate mobility, such as life or even volcanoes. Thus, from the 18th century on, it was through the thin fissure of natural history which had just been born, that light began to filter down into the vast depths under our feet. The depth estimated to be necessary for the formation of the world was still very modest, but at least the impetus had been given, and the way out opened up. After the walls of space had been shaken by the Renaissance, from Buffon on, it was the floor of time that started to shift and the ceiling as a result. And since then, under the relentless pressure of facts, the process has only accelerated. And although the easing up has been in process for nearly 200 years, it still has not managed to release the spirals of the world. There is always more distance between turns and other turns that appear down below. Now during these first phases of human awakening to cosmic immensity, space and time were so large that they remained homogeneous in themselves and independent of each other. Although they clearly became vaster and vaster, they continued to be two separate containers where things seemed to pile up and float without any definite physical order. Both compartments had become immeasurably enlarged, yet the objects inside each of them seemed to be just as freely transposable as before. What difference did it make whether they were put here or there, moved forward or back, or even eliminated at will? Even if one did not formally venture into this mental game, there was still no clear idea at what point or why it was impossible and no one ever posed the question. It was not until well into the 19th century, again under biology's influence, that the light finally began to dawn, revealing the irreversible coherence of everything that exists, showing the interlinking of life, and soon after, of matter, showing that the smallest molecule of carbon is a function of the total sidereal process, and that the smallest protozoan is structurally so interwoven with the web of life that its existence hypothetically cannot be extinguished without, from this very fact, the entire network of the biosphere unraveling, showing that the distribution, succession, and mutual interdependence of beings are born from their concrescence in a common genesis. That time and space are organically joined together so as to weave together the stuff of the universe. This is the point we have reached, and as much as we perceive today. What psychology lies behind this initi initiation? If the whole of history were not there to guarantee for us that once a truth has been seen, even if only by a single mind, it always ends up by impressing itself on the totality of human consciousness. There would be good reason to lose courage or patience when we see how many of even the best minds today still remain closed to the idea of evolutionary movement. Uh, post to part two.